Good morning, LBC Radio. This is Corey Rosen with The Story, and today I have a special guest, John Terlazzo, with me. John Terlazzo gave his first public poetry reading at Martin Memorial Library, York, PA, where he was 18 years old with virtually no publicity. He read his early poems to an audience numbering 85 that night. Out of that reading, and in the two years that followed, Terlazzo has co-founded the York Poets Union, a loosely knit group of some 300 poets and writers who presented public readings and writing workshops. A truly egalitarian group, each member had the right to call himself or herself president of the York Poets Union if that would in some way serve them. Since that time, Terlazzo has given hundreds of poetry readings and concerts of his original songs in Pennsylvania, Maryland, Vermont, New York, Massachusetts, and other areas of the U.S., as well as Mexico, Canada, and Europe. John has performed with various musical groups, including the Widowed Horse Folk Review, a band of beggars, and the New Transcend- Transcendentalists. And over and for over 25 years, now has been the leader and songwriter of the for the ensemble of Voices in the Hall. Voices in the Hall offers a up a rich array of strong har- vocal harmon <laughs> strong vocal harmonies. And combined with his old world instrumentation, which include acoustic guitars, accordion, flute, cello, mandolin, recorders, tin whistles, upright and fretless bass, percussion, piano, and Hammond B3 organs. The result is a kind of modern surrealist gypsy music, a phrase coined by one of the audience members after seeing the performed band in Lenox, Massachusetts, a music that is both timeless and centering. John Talazzo's songs and poems take us through the surreal and otherworldly village terrains. John Talazzo speaks and howls, dances and whispers, and raves when he reads poetry, sings, or teaches in a classroom or the retreat center. He laughs and invites us into our wonder and our grief, discussing ideas with his audience then and there, and sermonizes and apologizes and then takes us all back and laughs some more. He invites us into some 30-odd years of his poetry. And with all that said, John, how are you doing today? <laughs> <laughs> Just fine. Good. Good. So what started your love for poetry and the song? Mm. Where did, you, did it just come to you naturally? Did you hear a song on the radio? Did you hear an album? I, I think it was a combination of uh, things in my very young life. Um, I was, you know, when I was maybe about nine years old, um, I had some very intensely beautiful experiences that I can't even begin to define. Uh, and combined with that, I was a, uh, I was a kid in a Catholic school, mm. which was a very mixed bag. But one of the really wonderful things about it was that there were nuns there who told mystical folk tales that were astonishing and that would just set me on fire when they would speak, you know. And those those really um, moved deeply within me at approximately the same time when I was nine that the Beatles arose in the world. Mm. And those things combined and combined with the counterculture that arose uh, from many places, but but most clearly from and through the Beatles. Um, all of that, you know, led me to Bob Dylan, Leonard Cohen, Bruce Coburn, and many more. And uh, Joni Mitchell, Laura Nero, a lot of really potent and amazing and wonderful songwriters. Um, and then all of that combined with you know, sort of what feels to me like almost information from past lives when I look at medieval music and um, as well as modern music. It's all of these things sort of combined together. Uh, so. so you found a love for music through the Beatles, and you, you were even talking about some medieval stuff. Was that from the Catholic school at all? Well, uh, sh- sure, I think so. I think one of the most, one of the best things about that experience, one of the most beautiful, was, um, you know, singing in Latin when you're a little kid. That's a pretty powerful thing, and very hard thing. <laughs> uh, oh, but it was wonderful, and 
um, you know, to lift up those voices together that way was, was pretty great. So I, I'm, I'm sure that that started your interest in uh, intercultural or multicultural music. Yeah. Where did you find your specific... I guess that's where it is, but how did it grow? Did you start listening to other cultures music and then uh, figure Well, out- again, you know, being um, being a young kid in the 60s, mm-hmm. um, and there was, a, there was a tremendous amount of organic wisdom that arose. Uh, young people were absolutely tearing down walls, and they were embracing one another. And so I, uh, that combined with some nuns in my school who told me, who taught me that we, were, that we are all the children of God, mm-hmm. that, there, that there's only one race. Um, it, it, multiculturalism became an automatic for me mm-hmm. to the point that I don't even think of myself as an American. I never really have. I think of myself as a human being and that we're all here on this planet and we're all here together. And mm-hmm. unless we embrace one another, we're doomed. So do you find music as that uh, venue of bringing people together? Yes. I think that's one of, the, one of many things that, that will do that. And certainly, again, in the 60s, uh, I was, you know, I was um, diving into music from all sorts of cultures and all sorts of races and um, uh, learning a, a tremendous amount from that and through that. And again, it was really organic. I mean, it was the sort of mainstream AM radio pop music, you know, Bobby Vinton and that sort of thing meant nothing to us once the Beatles arose. And then mm-hmm. for, out of that comes, you know, you're, you're seeing um, uh, the Mercy Beat from England. You're seeing Motown. You're seeing um, uh, psychedelic music arising in, you know, in California and again in England. And all of that is completely organic. Mm-hmm. The, 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 the music corporations, or, you know, the, no, the corporations were scratching their heads. They didn't know what to do with that. Right. The music companies at that time was, you know, were owned by people who loved music, who deeply loved music. And they weren't that huge. Um, and uh, that was a really, really potent time to be growing music in in you know the garden um so that was that was a great um experience for me a great introduction as a child so as you uh you start expanding your worldview and your and getting more interested in the music what was your first you uh was your first concert that poet that poetry place where the 85 people in the audience or oh no 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 i was eight I was sorry. Okay. I was 18 when that happened. Um, no, no, much earlier than that. Um, uh, so I saw the Beatles when I was nine. I was the lead singer in my first band, which was called Conspiracy, when I was 10. Mm. And the other guys in the band were all older guys. They were like, you know, 11, 12, maybe 13. And um, so, w- you know, we were doing music wherever we could, and mm. we did it. We did. Uh, we played some songs at um, I don't know some sort of thing that was happening in our Catholic school, and uh, it, you know a number of different performers, and we sang "The Doors Light My Fire," mm. uh, which caused the Monsignor to stand up and storm out of the room. So we felt like, oh, we must be doing something right, um, and so we just. We grew from there. Um, Then when I was about 13, 1968, here in Lancaster at Franklin and Marshall College, I'm 13 and I went to see Jefferson Airplane, Mm -hmm. the most incredible live uh, experience, first concert of a live band. I mean, I had seen some other bands in my town, but I'm saying someone famous, and they were not just merely famous. They were, when you put these six people together on a stage, it was incredible, the, the, the energy between these six people as they were creating 
I mean, these songs were never done the same way twice, and they were mm-hmm. always, and there was no showbiz involved in it. They weren't trying to be impressive. Mm-hmm. They were just creating great song, and that was more impressive than any showbiz can ever be, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, so what was it like back then to record music at all? Did you, did you deal with any of that, or was it just performing or... And just writing music. Uh, it was mostly performing. I mean, we you know we started to record some stuff, but it was like you know real to real things. And um, uh, one of my great friends, a guy named Doug Smith, uh, he had some real to real equipment, and he loved to record. And so when we were teenagers, uh, high school, and then beyond that, um, Doug was you know we'd play anywhere, and Doug would come and record it. Hmm in these various bands that we had put together. And uh, he had a big bakery truck, which he had all these reel-to-reel things in, and he would you know, drive to wherever we were and do this stuff. Um, and he's been recording my albums ever since, uh, now all through all sorts of advances in technology. But So do those early recordings exist anywhere? Some of them do. And in fact, um, this... The most recent album, we've we've done nine or ten albums now, and the most recent one was a remake of our of my first album, which was called Honor Among Thieves. But this remake now is that original album plus an additional seven songs of live stuff that was recorded in like the late nineteen seventies. Doug recorded that mm. that stuff, so seven songs there of which I'm very pleased, and we're we're. We're toying with the idea of doing a double album of live recorded songs of Voices in the Hall and various incarnations um, over a 40-year period. So we're toying with that. We'll see where it goes. So so Doug has all that. Yeah, he's got all that stuff in his studio. So the idea of that album would be uh, like a performance in maybe 1970 and then a performance done in 1984 mm-hmm. and then and just seeing the differences and mm-hmm. the little stuff. That's really cool. Mm-hmm. That's something I've been really interested in doing because I write songs and there are, uh, for example, I, wor- I wrote a worship song, but in my mind, it, I orchestrated it with the, an orchestra, but granted for my senior apology, for a little bit, for my senior project, <laughs> we don't have a, uh, a an orchestra just on hand to use. So I, I did it in you know the regular worship set with guitars and bass, and it sounded really really good. Mm-hmm. But I also really really enjoy the 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 our the orchestral version as well. Yeah. So and there's and nobody has it's om- it's not the case that people re-release songs done different ways. So I've, but I've always been interested in doing that. Mm-hmm. So I'm glad I've, I finally met someone who's, yeah, yeah, who's yeah. willing to do yeah, that. Yeah, that's awesome. So when you do, so you did say you did do it also with a with a uh, orchestra. No, I I use I use Logic at all, um, and I use sample in uh, orchestra that way. Okay. So I would love to record it with like live orchestra, but I just don't know that many musicians yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but um, yeah, so. That's that's the main way that I did it. But for my senior project, I had to gra- grab a f- few of the music worship arts majors, and they did a stellar job. Yeah, yeah. Nice. So it almost made me consider switching it over, but yeah, I just I lo- I'm a f- such a fan of the strings and, and the French horns. I just had to have. Yeah, yeah. Had to have it. Yeah. So yeah. So we're uh working your way up into. When did you start? So you did songs at nine throughout the ages. And did you also do poetry as well? The writing stuff? Or? Yeah. Um, so I was singing songs like since I was like 10, nine, 10, uh, and in bands. I didn't start writing songs till high school. Mm. And it was around that time that I also really started digging into poetry. What were your poet- uh, What were your inspirations in regard to poets? Oh, all sorts of people. Um, uh, Yeats, uh, Leonard Cohen, um, Allen Ginsberg, who I, again, I met here in Lancaster one day. Uh, uh, Mirabai and Lala were Persian uh, and Hindu mystics long ago. Uh, Hafiz, who is also one of those. Um, I mean, it goes on and on. There's lots and lots of people there. Gotcha. So what, what what was the subject matter of your poems when you first started? And has that changed at all throughout the years? 
Well, uh, you know, on a certain level, I mean, human beings change as they grow older. Right. But on a certain level, I think the I think a lot of the subject matter has remained the same. Mm. Uh, but it's seen through various different ways. Yeah, different yeah. eyes. Um, you know, the the I mean, one of the things, you know, you remember, I remember, uh, and maybe you've seen some of these interviews. I don't know that, you know, they would they would talk to the Beatles, you know, and say, well, mm -hmm. what what made you want to do this? And they would say, well, we saw this. Elvis Presley concert and there were all these girls screaming at him and and we thought oh that looks like a good job you know mm -hmm. and and they would joke about that of course there's a lot more that drew them to it than that um so there was some of that I'm sure but there was also again just from a really early age I've had um and it's not even something that I can really describe in words or explain in words but I've had some really pretty powerful sort of mystic for lack of a better term experiences and um, that moves me very deeply into poetry and music and both of those from an angle of trying to comprehend the incomprehensible mm -hmm. trying to speak what cannot be spoken that's that's what my whole life has been about and I'm enormously grateful about that but it it uh i think it i think anything that is you know if we're if we're going to use the term art then it has to go very deep and it has mm -hmm. to go from a place that has some psychic weight to it and it has to go from a place that is deep 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 down inside the heart and can't be defined in mere words so poetry is digging deep into your soul and finding specific ways of saying things that are unsayable in a cohesive manner. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. I mean, uh, it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an absolute given that every single human being, the, the very finest and the most vile and, and horrific, Nonetheless, every single human being comes into this world right from the beginning longing for truth, mm -hmm. longing for essence. And every single... If we're fortunate, we are, we are taught to put our ego aside. And move into a place of deep and profound uh, love and compassion. If we're, if we're wise, that's what we're doing with our children. We're, we're, we're leading them in that direction. Mm -hmm. And when we go there, then the realization has to be that no matter what religion you're um, grasping for the essence from or truth, no matter uh, science, philosophy, all of this should be a place of great tenderness and humility for all of us to embrace. To me, it's like um, when people talk about God as if they know what exactly is the story or exactly are the rules. I tend to shy away a little bit because it, to me, it's like, you want to talk about God? We should be climbing, you know, we should be... Um, sort of crawling under a rock in humility mm -hmm. because it's not going to be described in words. We have to go much deeper than that. There, there is a tendency to want to describe God in, these, in a box, and it, it's impossible if God is supposed to be this unfathomably, um, in, at least in the Christian standpoint, uh, unfathomable indescri or indescribable, infinite, all-powerful, all-knowing. There's... If, if, if he, we're just simply not mm -hmm. all powerful, all knowing. We can't be everywhere at once, and it's it. We don't have the language or experience to even define that outside of those words, or what it's like to be like outside of those words. It's it just, it's, it would, I'm sure it's driven people insane <laughs> trying to think about that because it's so 
incomprehensible that and I'm sure the brain would just shut off if it tried to comprehend at all. So I, I really do think it's it is unfortunate that people do try to uh, create a box for something so infinite and so um, vast yeah. as God. Yeah. Yeah. Um, God, truth, love. These are words that don't come close to defining what we're trying to approach there. And, um, and certainly not in the English, English language at all. Yeah. And we can, you know, we can go much deeper in our experience. Again, if we're doing it from a place of uh, open-heartedness and humility, and um, and then it's possible, I think. Well, I know that it's possible then for for human beings to um, move into their true nature and the. Um, what do you believe the human's true nature might be? Well, uh, again, to try to say this in words is absurd, mm-hmm. but um, let me sort of try to couch it a little bit this way. A very good friend of mine, a guy named Marty Nabholtz. Um, Marty once said to me, you know, just because you're born into the body of a human baby doesn't automatically make you human. And he said, you know, that there's labor you have to do throughout your life to grow into what it means to become a human being. Mm -hmm. And that is something that is the opposite of materialism. Right. And I believe he's absolutely right. And so, you know, I think that there have been many cultures on earth at different times that... Well, f- uh, number one, I think it's important to say that every culture on earth that uh, is worth its salt, and so we have to say everyone then, within all of these traditions, within all of these cultures, every great mystic, whether whether we're talking about Jesus or Buddha, uh, Al-Halaj, um, uh, you know, on and on and on, you know, all of these are beings that when they were walking on this planet said um, you have to rein in your ego so that it doesn't run the show and many traditions and cultures learned that from these beings and worked with that America now since say the industrial revolution um, you know, or a little bit past that, America now in particular, and sort of the West, if you want to use that term, has really moved into a place of um, not only have we not taught generation after generation, you have to rein in your ego. You have to put it in its place so it's not running the show. Not only have we not taught that to children, but instead we've replaced it with capitalism, with an economic system that says ego is God and your ego is God and go buy some more stuff. And that's really heartbreaking on many levels, including the fact that it's led us into a system where real charlatans have risen into some very high places and caused horrific, violent havoc in the world. And uh, so we really need to look at that. And if we really care about our children, then we have to become elders, not merely, uh, you know, good businessmen or something like that. Mm. Um, I mean, another example. A number of years ago, you know, the, the, it, it became very obvious and clear to people that caffeine was not good for children. So, so, you know, it was advised that they should stop putting caffeine into so many sodas that would then mm-hmm. cause damage to children. 
rather than doing the responsible adult thing, which would have been that. Right. Instead, they literally got together in boardrooms around tables and said, hey, how can we sell more caffeine to children? And then they created more drinks that had more caffeine and that were more addictive and therefore more damaging to children. Okay, and now we can focus on selling it to that crowd, and they'll buy it because they'll see it as sort of, um, uh, you know, rebellious. Mm -hmm. Think about how horrible that is. And if that had happened in some, in some um, culture 500 years ago, sort of a tribal culture, and someone said, well, we found something that's really bad for children, and someone else said, oh, let's see if we can figure out how to sell more of it to them. Be cast out. Absolutely yeah. would have been cast out. But now we give those people big awards and big raises. You know, there, that's... I want to push back slightly, but you are right. There, there's the FDA, or, or at least the American food system, is u- ultra horrible for us to eat, like mm-hmm. the processed foods and yeah. the just like, American cheese is almost fake. Yeah, it's almost fake cheese. Yeah, um, but I will push back slightly on the capitalism idea uh-huh. because capitalism is just a private trade of goods and services, uh-huh. at least in my opinion. So yeah. it's I do believe that it's it's helpful for, but. Things can always be taken too far. Yeah, and that's what that's what I definitely think. Yeah, and all I'm saying about that is I'm not I'm not uh, so capitalism, communism, socialism. These are just economic systems. They're ways of handling money. On their own, they have no um, ill intent. Th- th- yeah, they have no ill intent on their own, mm-hmm. and there's no morality one way or the other. It's just. Okay, how do we handle money? This is the way we'll do it. What matters is that the beings in charge of these different traditions, these different societies, if they are coming from a place of great heart, then those systems, any one of those three systems would work beautifully. But if they're coming from a place of I want more for myself, whether it's money or power or both, then you have the horrific thing that you're seeing now, which is, you know, um, the 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 previous president signed laws that said corporations are free to poison the water and the air as much as they want. Go ahead, feel free, free reign. This is the water and the air that you and I breathe and drink. That our children, our grandchildren, his grandchildren. This is complete insanity, all for a dollar to make more money. This is really broken. And so the problem isn't capitalism itself. If you have some really wise and open-hearted and thoughtful, compassionate beings running the system, beautiful. It could work wonderfully. It's just the people who are in charge of that. And that, and that goes for all things because you know, the, the evils of Stalin or uh, yeah. current— Yeah, that's what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah, Putin, a lunatic. You know, the, the best of what— um, uh, communism could have given us or the best of what socialism could give us. You know, the, it's, it's there. It is possible. It is possible. But the problem is, is that, again, you know, Putin is just another... Um, Authoritarian. Yeah, he's a thug. You know, he, and he wants what he wants for himself and he doesn't care about anybody else. So, uh, you know, that's the issue and that's what we need to look at and... Um, again, I think encouraging people to move into deeper and deeper areas of thought and education and um, humble and compassionate learning together is extremely important. Unlike, you know, there's a movement right now to really shut down education altogether. We can't let that happen. What do you think about the... uh because the whole idea behind that movement, the shutdown education movement, is to bring the like family closer, closer together. It won't. Do you think? But do you think that that is part of, part of our problem that our families have been so distant? We don't ask our children, "Hey, how was school today?" Or we don't care about where we're sending our children off to. And then and then they come back, and sometimes they hate us, or sometimes 
do, do you think because we we abandon our children for you know we have to get that salary we have to we have yeah to that's a that very stuff. bad idea and and again that's something that um uh that's a very horrific ill that capitalism has visited upon us. And it's a shame because it doesn't have to be that way. It shouldn't be that way. Um, throughout every culture on earth, going back as far as one can go back, um, it's always been the case that adult males have uh, initiated boys into becoming men and adult women have initiated girls into becoming women. They've shown them the way, and they've done it through simple things like teaching, you know, how to do, you know, how to build a fire, how to knit a sweater, but also much more intensely beautiful and thoughtful and inner uh, labors. Um, and for instance, uh, um, preparing a young person for it, and then taking that young person into the forest and drawing a circle in the ground and um, uh, giving that person some water. And he, know, he or she knows exactly what's going to happen, which is they're going to spend the next several days there alone. And they're not going to go out of the circle. Um, and then there's much more that comes you know, along right. with that. Uh, with all these traditions, you know, the, the, for instance, in Polynesia, they used to have this tradition. After many, many days of, of meditation and preparation to do it, after this meditation and preparation, mm -hmm. then uh, these people who were, you know, one of the initiations was, for instance, tying these long vines to their ankles and leaping from a cliff. And the vines were... Um, measured at exactly the right length so that when the person came, they, they would, their nose would come like you know, six to eight inches from the ground. Now, we can't comprehend somebody trying to teach somebody to do that. No. However, think about this. They were right. doing that with a very deep, solid, meaningful intent. And now, in education exactly, exactly. Now, in recent years, that's not there, but what did we do? What did we put in, in its place without even recognizing the connection? Bungee jumping, which is exactly the same, same thing, thing, except yep. there's no preparation, there's no deep thought, there's no meaning, and you charge the kid $85 to do it. That is what you call abuse of children. This is, you know, this, it's absolutely horrific. So another example would be meditation. Mm. Um, in India, they would teach young people to meditate for long hours, something I deeply um, would encourage. Um, and, and there's more. There's more. I, again, at one point, um, there was tattooing that different tribes would mm -hmm. do. But you only got that tattoo after you accomplished this or that thing over there. Right. After you accomplished your you know, one-month walk into the desert and back or whatever it was. Now you can get a tattoo from anybody for anything, whether it looks good or not. And you can get millions of them as long as you're willing to pay for it. But there's no meaning behind it. Or often there often, is Oftentimes not. there's no, yes. yes. There may be some, some tattoo people who, who are working on another level that I'm not aware of. That's very possible. But there's, there's this one really, one of my favorite uh, kind of examples of what you're talking about is there, there was a tribe in, I believe it was Africa, that uh, when you were born, they would create a song just for you. Yeah. And uh, whenever you did something bad, they would all kind of come around and sing you that song. And I feel like if that would be one, that's the one of the most, because yeah. it's, it's all about conviction. Yeah. And feeling that I did a wrong. There's, there's a, a lack of repentance and a lack of self-reflection in yes. America today where you have to realize, hey, maybe I did mess up. And there's a lack of ownership of of being being messed up. Yeah, and you got to realize, and there there's there seems to be a push of like social acceptance for all these uh, different things that like oh it's okay that I did this, but you, sometimes you have to realize that it's not okay that I did that, and yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And again, though, it you know how do you do that when when um, 
when everyone's pushing you to to do that. Yeah, or when you when you allow a person who's who's been uh, accused of rape thirty five times to become president of the United States without anybody questioning that, without anybody bringing that to court. How do you how do you then teach children you need to be responsible? Mm-mm. It doesn't work that way. You've got to you've got to make a decision. So you think- either either nobody's above the law, you know, or the whole thing is shot and it's ruined. So you think it's a top down problem, not a bottom up problem? Absolutely. Um, every every uh, child, uh, every young being on this planet, from you know whether it's whether we're talking about human beings or cows or dogs or all the way down to amoebas and paramecium, every single one of these beings learns how to be an adult version of itself by witnessing the adults around it. Now, since the Industrial Revolution, most young people hardly see the adults around them, except for a few hours at night, a couple minutes in the morning. At least the most important adults to them. Yeah. Yeah. And um, that's an atrocity, and it is causing all of all of the horrific violence that we're seeing. It, I mean, it, it's a major cause of violence. It's a major reason why so many males in our culture think that a gun is so important in their life, a killing machine. And it's just because they're empty. They're, they're empty. Um, you know, we've, we've, we've raised people... to think of heart as the very last thing, if at all. You know, rather, instead, they're, they're much more interested in, well, it, me. You know, it's, again, it's that ego thing. Mm-hmm. Me, me, it's about me, it's all me. You know, you know and it's just, um, that's monstrous, and it's very destructive, and, it'll, and it will be the poisoned ending of this planet if we don't get our act together really quick. Uh, so and and I think a major part of that has to be, from my perspective, um, it's always been really clear to me from the time I was a little kid that materialism is a waste of time. Um, obtaining more, getting more, it, it's just a waste of time. And I just you know we always made. I've always made a really clear decision in my life that if, um, well, uh, you know, we home we for the most part homeschooled our kids, my mm-hmm. wife and I, and uh, our two kids, and that was just an absolutely glorious experience. And part of that was maybe selfish because we just wanted to have a really solid relationship with them, and we thought that's more important than anything else, and. We didn't have a television. We didn't have electricity for a lot of the time they were growing up. We lived off the grid for a lot of that time. Uh, but even when we did have electricity, we didn't have a TV, and we read aloud all the time. Mm. So we would read aloud to our kids 40 hours a week easy, sometimes more, either one or both of us, you know, trading back and forth. Um, and part of how that resulted was... Our kids came to love stories mm-hmm. and imagery, imagery and words and uh, ideas and thoughts and reading at a very young age. Uh, and they, you know, it's like they kind of, you know, when you're constantly sitting there with a the kid, you know, leaning into your shoulder and you're reading to them and you're, you know, holding the book here, they don't always know every word that's in there. No. But, you know, you're reading uh, the Chronicles of Narnia. They might not know every word that describes the lion, but they get the lion. Yes. And they get the intensity and the power. And they get, um, you know, and lots of other books are like this, too. Um, um, Roald Dahl, who wrote the BFG, mm. Uh, mm. and a whole lot of other great... He has a brilliant book of short stories. You know... You learn, they learned the meaning of these bigger words without us having to really sort of 
nail it into them because they understood it in the context of the story. They'd hear it in my voice or my wife's voice. And as a result, they were also, by the way, looking over your shoulder all the time at the book. So they started to learn to read on their own. And they were already grasping words before anybody was teaching them how to form them on the paper. Right. Um, so, and, you know, it just became really clear to me that, that if, you, if, you have to, if you have to make a choice between more money or more time with your children. Oh, absolutely. It's always yeah, the it more has time to be. with your children. And, and that means you just own less and you buy less. And you, the thing you, is— You adapt to your children, not to— Yeah. You have to adapt your lifestyle that's best supports your child, yeah. obviously. And there have been times, you know, where, uh, um, you know, we struggled some with money, but nothing horrific. And there's, a, there's, a, there's another kind of wealth that's there and that remains there to this day. We're all really, really close. And what we did, too, was when we were homeschooling, we did it with a group of other families that were very like-minded. Mm. And all those kids grew up together. And they're all really good friends now. When, now that they're in their 40s, you know, in 30s, um, they're all really good friends, and they're my friends, and vice versa. They don't think of me as, you know, Mr. Terlazzo or anything like that, because we all grew up, you know, we, we, we were all family together, community, a village together. Uh, so, I'm not saying that I'm perfect, but I'm, right. what I am saying is that um, we need to place humanity and heart and love and compassion and thought, deep thought, way above, oh, what else am I going to buy today? Mm -hmm. Way above, you know, what's the next thing that I can own? You know, how can I save my money to buy this? You know, it's, we have to go much deeper or, or we're shot. We're, we're completely lost if we don't do that. Again, this planet is being poisoned and Unless we get to work right away and turn that around. I was listening to NPR yesterday. And um, um, with climate change, there's a whole big section of India right now where it's 120 degrees every day. and has oh, been yeah. for weeks. Yeah. And this is a place where there's no air conditioning. Right. And People's sandals will literally melt to yes, the roads. Yeah. And if we don't get to work immediately... I'm tired of hearing this foolishness that um, uh, climate change is a hoax. And, you know, it's like, come on, man, grow up, wake up. We're talking about the air that you breathe, the water that you drink, the planet that you live on. And you and anybody that you might love, if you're, comp you know, if you're, if you're able to do that, if you know what love means, whether it's for your children or whatever, understand that they will die horrible deaths if we don't get to work awfully quick have you heard of the technology that the navy has where so there's this growing technology that i really think is being has gone under the radar um but the navy they can take co2 out of the water and convert it into energy and it's we're almost at the point where we can start taking co2 and people are, people laugh at it. it's like well you just created trees but we're gonna need more than trees if we're exactly. gonna if we're gonna yeah. be able to take CO two out of the air and then yeah. convert that into its own energy that is completely green. Yeah. So the, the, the technology is coming. I find it though it's I would rather because um, here's the problem that we have in today's society. We are such an interconnected global community that if we com and there's some people who just completely want to shut off oil. If we did that millions billions maybe might die overnight because you got to think about that that we are the main ways that we get energy is from oil from burning coal uh using oil and the, the smallest percent is from solar and wind which yeah. is which is temporary no it can't be done over it, it can't can be, be done, done overnight. overnight that's for sure but, but we can invest in new technologies right and the other thing that needs to happen is to uh insist adamantly that those corporations that run oil companies, um, that run fossil fuels, that they get to work right away and invest a lot of time and energy into tra into switching over the labors of their workers. Because it's, it's horrible that this whole thing is like, you know, oh, they're going to take our coal away. Well, I'm going to vote against, you know, it's like, no. 
that's not what that's not what this is about. We're going to give you other jobs, right? But yes. those corporations have to be forced to do that because all they want is their fast buck as soon as possible. So that has to be changed dramatically. And and solar and wind are absolutely viable. Yes, but they are. you have to you have to absolutely invest the time and energy into making them happen while backing off. From the other thing it's it's something that cannot happen overnight and, right. and th- that's something that i really wish wasn't as mainstream as it is the the turning it off overnight because that's that's i mean, we saw what happened with with covid or and many people yeah. died from starvation and uh, so the, yeah. you know with the whole supply chain issue that we're having right now yeah from shutting down pretty right. much what would everything was shut down with oil yeah it's a, th- there's no way that we can do it overnight but yes it can be it, it can be a transitional thing but we have to we have to fund 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 for these yeah. new technologies because right. we can't go all electric because guess what runs our electric grid right coal right. and oil <laughs> right right it's it's it, it's always something that we have to keep pushing and work on new technologies like taking co2 out of the air and then yeah. converting that into some sort of substance that is green or going into nuclear which is a lot safer than what it was 40 50 years ago i have very strong opinions about that which I'll, you know so i'll differ with you on that one mm. they they still have not figured out what to do with the waste and as long as that's the case i think that there's a, there's a newer technology that uses beads instead so it uses up it, it uses it completely and turn, and it co- converts it all into just heat energy at that point, and so th- which uses yeah I've heard steam. some things about that I'm not sure I buy that yet but but anyway anyway yeah politics and and climate change aside we want to get into our uh, what is it that makes us create mu- music or what what par- what part of that inspires us what, what the human draw to story we kind of touched on that a little bit we we didn't really get into like the meat and potatoes of what makes us feel the need to say stories. What, what, what is the human need to create art for others, for ourselves and on and on. Do you think it comes from God? Do you think it comes from? Well, I think, I think again, that it's not something you can put words around it. You know, the, the, the essence, the ground of being. Um, you know, all of these words that we try to use to try to comprehend that essence, you know, that... And yet we... Again, none of those words will ever work fully. Mm-hmm. Um, so would you say an apt description would be taking the metaphysical into the physical? Sort of, yeah. I mean, I think, I think that's, I think that's part of why we write um, songs, paint pictures, and so on, uh, dance. You know, great, great dance. Um, it, I think it is. I think, well, I guess on a certain level, I think everything that we do, but it, most especially in my mind, art is about that labor that I was speaking of, of earlier of to become human. There's la- there are certain mm-hmm. labors we have to do. And that's part of it. And that's a major part of it to me. Um, do you think uh, art, meditation, and so on. And that... Uh, here, let me tell you, there's a wonderful... 1933, I think it was... Albert Einstein had a conversation with a great Indian poet named Rabindranath Tagore, who was wonderful. Two amazing beings sitting down talking mm-hmm. together. And uh, I read a transcript of their conversation. And one of the things in particular that, that was mind-boggling to me and was so beautiful was... <clears throat> One of them, and I don't remember which one, was trying to, you know, was saying, um, how do we, you know, how can we, how can we evolve enough 
to see the, the real depths of what's around us. Mm. And the other one said, yeah, because here's the scenario right now. And he said, you can take a moth to the great libraries of the world. And to that moth, the entire library is a great, unbelievably endless meal. Mm -hmm. It can eat every page in all those books. And it will eat that without being in any way aware of the wisdom of what's imparted on those page, mm -hmm. pages in words. He said, that's where human beings are at right now. Right. And that this whole universe is, you know, is that great library. But we are just totally stuck on, you know, pleasing our tongue the way that little moth would be. Not the tongue, literally, but more the yeah. ego. The ego. What can I do next that'll be fun? What can I do next that'll, you know, make me, uh, you know, feel good? Mm -hmm. And it's like, and that's, that's the story there. It's like if we, if we move deeply into art, if we move deeply into meditation, um, and there are other areas of life um, that maybe I'm not particularly involved with, I'm sure that, you know, for instance, I'm not very much interested in sports, but I'm sure that there are some people that know how to move into sports, perhaps especially running, in ways that take them into deeper and deeper places. Oh, absolutely. There's so many studies of like, you know, you can have the runner's high where you run after, run after a while and it just becomes natural and, it's, and you feel really good about it because it, it it's releases these endorphins and these uh, positive other chemicals that I can't remember the names right, of right now. Right, right. But uh, it, it's it's interesting how um, different humans find pleasure and like purpose in other things, whether it be sports, arts, uh, or whatever. Um. So would you say that? Um. Would you say that not participating in the arts is a loss of hu of your humanity? Well, I think that particularly if we're, if we're replacing it then with stuff that's really empty, uh, then yes, a, a, an enormous amount of what it means to be human is lost. And a person, m many people in this culture will not recognize that until they're on their deathbed, and many of them won't recognize it even then. Um, but there is, there is nothing... It, first of all, uh, let me say that I don't believe in the idea of talent. I believe wholly that um, every single human being has the ability, in, born into them, mm -hmm. has the ability to create great works of art, whether it's you know, music, poetry, painting, saxophone, cello, you know, ballet, whatever. Mm -hmm. Every single being, every single human being has that great ability to really excel. It's a matter of whether they get encouraged to do so or whether it gets crushed under the iron boot. And our culture mostly crushes it under the iron boot. And that's part of, you know, maybe I'm stubborn, but I'm, it's part of what I'm enormously grateful about. That I, there, there's no, there's no, there's, there's virtually no economic viability to being an artist in modern in this modern world uh it's very rare but so what so what yeah because right. it gives me riches on another level that are so much deeper and i'm gonna do it no matter what happens um and fortunately thank god you know there have been enough people interested in what i do that it that they do support it and i can live very frugally and simply but Thank God, you know, that there are people who love the work and that are drawn to it and, um, and, and who then begin to create themselves. That's the most important thing. So we're kind of running out our time on the radio. You have brought us a few songs of yours. The first one we're going to listen to is The Mists of Algiers. Mm. And so do you want to introduce that piece, talk about what, it's, what, what it is, what it's about at all? Uh, now let's just listen to it, and then if you want to ask me a question, okay, maybe we could cool. do that. 
Well, this is um, well, this is one of your first songs, isn't it? Uh, oh no, uh, this is this is from our most recent album. Mm. So this is from uh, may, I think we put the album out. I think maybe two years ago or a year and a half ago. Oh, this is the Mists of Algiers by John Terlazzo. Precious your eyelids Tattooed in cold Forged where the voice rings The smoldering soul I have faith that you'll transcend
fall down before Down on your knees Lay low your offering Of buckhorn and lily Show her your breast The holes made by spears And humble your gaze on The mists of Algiers So one of the questions I would have about that piece is that, is it about a woman or a place? Yes. Hey, okay, <laughs> fair enough. Um, yeah, uh, again, this is one of those songs that is not, um, some songs are more obvious to me, but some just come from someplace, and I don't question it. So this is more... My job is to get out of the way and right. just let it come through. Um, it, I mean, it has a few... Um, there are a few words in there that maybe it would be useful for people to know. Uh, it says, lay down your offering of bakur and lilies. Uh, mm. Bakur is a, a very old Persian combination of ointments and unguents. You know, it's like a sort of um, very old world perfumes. Um, and, and it also in the song um, mentions, uh, let's see, where's the phrase here? Um, And the Amrit floods the tongue, washes down over my chest. The Amrit uh, in India, Amrit is um, it's a it's a very uh, so there's a gland in the center of your forehead, pineal yeah, right. gland, and the pineal gland. Um, I remember many years ago, when I first started doing sitting meditation, I met a scientist at that time who was totally fascinated with this because the pineal gland. Um, produces a, a substance that um, is, is completely on its own. And it's, it's sort of a, I don't want to use the word too solidly, but maybe let's say a visionary substance. Mm. But the thing is for that substance to, be, to come into being, it requires light. And there's no light in the right. center of your skull. <laughs> um, and so that's an interesting thing because here we have this very specific, clear, scientific fact. It's growing here in the center of your forehead. There's no light there. And combine that with the fact that um, Indian mystics, Hindus, Sufis, uh, have been saying for many, 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 many centuries, they've been talking about the Amrit, which mm -hmm. is a gift from God, which is this um, uh, flo flowing nectar that comes from the center of the forehead uh, in meditation in particular. So um, that's what that's about. But it, you know, I don't, some of these songs, I just, again. It just came to you. I Yeah, I do my best to just get out of the way and just write down what's been given. And, uh, yeah. Well, if you want to listen to more of these songs, you can follow John on, on Spotify. Are you on Spotify? I, actually, I'm not on Spotify. I've had mixed feelings about Spotify, but I, I'm, it may be on there in the future. We'll see. But uh, it's 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 there through Bandcamp at the Bandcamp. moment. Bandcamp. Uh, yeah. the, is there a specific? And through my web, you know, if you just go to johntrelazo.com, oh, there go. there's some stuff there you can click on. And do you do events? When, when is your next event? Is yeah, Bandcamp? concerts and things. Um, yeah, well, so, you know, with um, uh, – with the pandemic, of course, we shut down and didn't do anything publicly for mm -hmm. two years or a little more. Uh, so we we just did a, a thing last week just for fun outdoors. We're doing another outdoor thing at um, Unitarian Universalist Church of York, uh, June 10th, which is a Friday night. That's yeah. Right. I, well, if you want to see more of him, you can go to that event, or you can go to his website. We're going to go back to the radio and continue live on facebook.com for slash the story, where you'll hear some of John's 
personal poems and a bit more of his life. With that said, I hope you guys have enjoyed this podcast. All right, so now I want to hear um, more of your poetry, and and so you have a, a poet po- a, a poem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I so I just was looking through here and I sort of picked out four, but I'll just pick one of those. So let's try this one. This is called "Make No Mistake." Is there anything we should know before you start? Or? Uh, that's what I was just trying to decide before I started <laughs> reading here. Um, or, no, let's just do that one. Okay, make no mistake. Uh, I think, I think uh, it's pretty clear. And if not, we'll talk about it after. Mm-hmm. To want nothing save to open to the aching and the longing, that's a gift. To take a life or harm another, that is the most vile, the most shameful act. It is an honor to willingly die for the truth, to live for the truth even more so. So don't mistake some prayer for the energy that rolls through your veins. Some people spend their whole life in a cage counting on the jailer to bring them sustenance. Then they act surprised when no liberation comes. Only a few turn their backs on the warden, become smoke, and curl effortlessly in spires through the bars. Others dare to parade about as if their puny and insipid sense of authority holds some water as if their flags and banners are not an arrogant obscenity against that great swirling mass of consciousness, the white clouds of the sky. Don't mistake any nation for the world. And you, you who've sewn your labels into the angels' wings, who own the patent on holy water, who claim the real estate of one Jerusalem or another? You look good on paper, but you are no less than thieves, steeped in deep denial. And the eyes of the wise see beyond that paper. So here's some advice. Don't mistake the chalice for the wine. Hmm. So that's all about uh, stealing away from these, uh, from the governments, these ide- ideologies and <laughs> these, and it's basically the ego conversation we had, just stealing yeah, away from that. It's and certainly related. Yeah. Um, is there anything more to say on that or is that pretty much it? Well, I think I think that uh, I think you're you're hitting a nail on the head, and I think there's more than one. Oh yeah. Um, it, uh, only in that. Um, I love this. Uh, there was a, there was a. A time when somebody asked Picasso to, explain a painting he did, and he said, um, uh, "People who people who ask to explain paintings are barking up the wrong tree." Right. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So I mean, you know, I, uh, and and I don't. I mean, I don't mean that in a snide way. But it's it's simply that, again, I, a lot of what happens in my poetry, my song, my paintings, a lot of what happens there is not. A, um, intellect is not running the show. Mm. Something else. It's more abstract than something. Something much deeper inside. And um, so there are times when I can easily explain uh, what this song is about or that poem, and there are other times where it's like I haven't got a clue. And literally that there have been times where I've written some poems and, or songs and read them or performed them for six months or six years, and then one day it was like, oh, 
Right. It suddenly became clear to me, that's what that was about. I was doing such and such at that time. Look at what happened here. Mm. Um, and that's a great joy to me, to have that kind of trust and faith, to just say, yep, I'm just going to, you know, like, I'm, j- I'm going to open up. Just please, just come through me. Let's do this. Mm-hmm. And just use me. And uh, that's a great joy. That's a great joy. I, I'm curious, uh, moving on from the, the poetry aspect and other things, I want to talk about the organizational uh, things you've done in, in, in your, over your years, specifically about the, uh, the York's Poetry Union. <laughs> and how, how do you gather that kind of a big event? What, what, what is the methodology behind you know, first starting it and then keeping it going? Yeah. Well, at that time, I was quite young, um, 18, 19, and I was deeply influenced by some great friends, uh, a handful of poets, most especially by a poet named Gary Moore, um, who, who is a wonderful being. Um, and he's 10 years my senior. And um, um, he, he was a great mentor to me, uh, a great influence. And so... You know, Gary and I were talking, and um, he was asking. You know, he was asking about my poetry, and I would show him my poems, and we would sit and talk and read these poems aloud. And and then uh, one day I said to him, um, "Let's do a reading at Martin Library." And he said, "John, this is York. Nobody's going to be interested." Mm. So we set up this reading, and, and as that bio said, there were 85, 87 people showed up that night. And, Not nobody. And that was with, well, it was with no publicity. Right. I mean, uh, nothing. We put a little, there was a little blurb in the newspaper. That was it. Oh. And, um, and all these people showed up. And then within a few weeks after that, there were suddenly like 300 people came out of the woodwork who were writing poetry and wanted to share it with one another. And it was pretty quick. Really? And uh, so this York Poets Union thing arose, the name of which was a joke, um, <laughs> and and it was all just a great joy, you know. And we started, we coordinated a bunch of readings, and you know, we'd have uh, sort of festivals, and you know, people would read together, and uh, audiences would come and grow, and it was just, it was a really great, interesting. Uh, thing to have happen when I was 18, 19. Is that still an ongoing thing? or? Uh, no, it doesn't. I mean, there are still people in York that are writing poetry and gathering and doing some readings and things. Um, and I know a few of them, but I don't know a lot of them um, just because my life has wound up getting wrapped up in kind of going in some other right. directions uh, in terms of uh, performance and so on. And especially, too, because... I'm I'm much more focused on writing songs than uh, poems per se at this point in my life. Mm. Although a lot of the songs that I'm writing, it's it's all poetry anyway yeah, because yeah, it, it really all, is about it's anyway. about the words. Yeah. Um, any song that I write, I mean, even what you what you heard there, um, I have some wonderful friends, Christina and Paul, and other musician friends that are just astonishing and. I love to to do this with them. I love it when we can record together and perform together and so on. Um, but they're much better musicians than I am usually. Mm. I I know enough to put chords together and some interesting picking things that I can do or strums. But mostly, I just need I know enough to do that so that I can then create words around that. And that's that's really where my abilities lie and um, again where my practice has has been has lain all these years mm. um, I started uh, I started doing sitting meditation when I was 17 I first read the Upanishads when I was 17 and, and the Upanishads are uh, the Upanishads are, are uh, I wish I had a copy with me they are an amazing uh, Hindu holy book Mm-hmm. And they are uh, they come out of what is called um, Vedanta, Advaita right. Vedanta, and so they um, 
these are there's no like sort of you know book of Matthew or Mark or you know it, that yeah. these are all people who nobody knew. They were they were sadhus and mystics and holy men and and madmen and mad women that lived in the jungles in India, you know, four thousand years ago, and they they just had these very astonishing and direct experiences of God and of this idea of um, moving past one's ego mm-hmm. to to really witness why we were put here. And so all of that started when I was about 17, and, um, and then two started, you know, as I said, uh, when, I, when I was about 15 was when I began writing poems and songs, so all of that grew together, and I've been consistently and constantly uh, doing all of that for whatever this is now, 48 years or something. So for in regards to the, the, the union, mm-hmm. was there ever any meetings, or was it just like, mm-hmm. oh, we're going to be at this place at this time? Yeah. Show up. No, it was just anybody that was a part of that group, You know, if they wanted to do a poetry reading, they would just schedule it, and they'd say the York Poets Union presents, and if they'd send something to the newspaper, they'd say, mm. you know, Mary Smith, president of the York Poets Union, said, or, you know, Joe, you know, Joe Jones, <laughs> you know, president of the York Poets Union. I mean, it said that. You know, it's like if, right. it, if, it, if it meant that the newspaper would listen to you by saying, you know, but it was totally disorganized. There was no structure. It was a lot of, um, you know, just wonderful hippies and poets who just had things to say and decided to say them and and support one another in doing it. And that's of major importance. Mm -hmm. That is the opposite of, uh, you know, the the, the, The the, the horrible sickness of what capitalism has become is uh, constant competition of everything. And that, there's nothing more destructive to humanity than that. Um, You know, all these, apparently there are all these... um, television shows now that they're calling reality shows, which are people uh, biting each other's necks and stabbing each other in the back and crushing mm-hmm. each other constant over the most absurd and meaningless things uh, or meaningful things treated as meaningless things like, mm. you know, marriage. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, yes. And it's, um, again, that's that's materialism with a capital M. I mean, it's, you know, and it's the opposite of art, you know. All these, um, what are the, what are these shows called? Um, American Idol and that sort of oh, stuff. Oh yeah, okay. America's Got Talent, American yeah. Idol. Again, all that you know. Most of these people aren't number one creating their own work, right? And then all it's about is show business and ego and uh, outdoing somebody else and competing. Mm. All of that is madness. Bela Bartok. Great yes. classical composer. Bartok. Bela Bartok said, uh, competitions? Competitions are for horses, not artists. He was brilliant. Yeah, oh yeah. And I, it's, I love and, Bartok. You know, even if you never heard his music, just that quote alone, that's yeah. brilliant. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and it's what, it, it really is how we should be functioning with everything in the world. Forget competitions. What are we going to do to uh, support one another and raise one another up? When we do that, we all gain. We mm-hmm. all win. There's a lot of uh, temptation to tear each other down, mm-hmm. uh, especially if we if we meet someone who, in our subjective manner, view as worse than yeah. than us. And and that's, I, in my opinion, I think yeah. that that's almost rooted in humanity itself. We we feel envy and jealousy all the time. It's something we have to fight yeah. uh, all the time. But uh, it, it's so. It's so much better if we, and that's part of the why I, I made this podcast it was to bring people together of all different, all different sizes and viewpoints, and to really show that hey, it's really all about community. There's no, yeah. there's no, there's because I, I don't know if if you knew this or if I've explained this to you, but there was like three distinct kind of segments or. Uh, communities within the Lancaster music scene. Hmm. There are, there's the theaters, mm-hmm. there's the church slash classical music mm-hmm. musicians, and then there's like the gigging musicians that, mm-hmm. you know, and it's all very segregated. 
mm-hmm. you know, they, I, I feel like I'm one of the only people within, within this area that can say, yeah, I perform gigs, I've done th- musical theater, and I've, I've performed yeah. at church and other, other, yeah. other spaces. Yeah. And I, when I say that to other people, they're like, in the church, like you go to bars and do all this <laughs> stuff. If I if I'm the musical theater, you know, it's yeah. it, you you. It's kind of the same thing because it's a lot of the theaters around here are Christian, mm-hmm. but um, it's like well, you make money doing gigs, like that's that's beneath us almost. Yeah. Or um, it's it, it's 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 a shame. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of talent out there, mm-hmm. and it would be so much better if. And so, so much more, so much more better for the economy, especially around here. If if we had just joined together a little bit and said, yeah. "Hey, we're yeah. going to support music no matter what. We yeah. don't, we don't care. It's music is music, and it's it's great for the community, and it's great for our spirit, and it is great for our local area. We're mm-hmm. gonna mm-hmm. we're gonna support people, and mm-hmm. uh, we're gonna commune with food, and we're gonna have a great time and create great memories." Yeah. Yeah, anything we can do to get people interacting, I think, is a very good idea. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's that's one of the main goals of the podcast. Is eventually, I want to put together a festival and uh, bring all these different people out there because you know that diversity is great, mm-hmm. especially to draw people out. Mm-hmm. And, and then it gets people involved in different circles because there's with within the gigging community alone, there's a whole bunch of circles that you know. This yeah. group doesn't interact mainly with this group, yeah. and doesn't interact mainly with this group. And there's all sorts of drama that happens as well. Yeah. Granted, you know, there's no shortage of drama in the world. <laughs> um, so, and it, it's just breaking breaking those stigmas and breaking down the the ego that mm-hmm. that really because that's what, that's what envy and jealousy really comes from is is your is your ego, mm-hmm. and just showing that hey, we're all humans. Mm-hmm. And if you talk to people like humans, they're gonna mm-hmm. most likely interact with you yeah. as a human as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's one of the main points, and and <laughs> I feel like we've gone overboard with that message uh, a lot. I want to talk about um, what the difference is between you as a musician now and you as a musician starting, whether it be overcoming challenges of social media, the internet, uh, different recording. Uh, <laughs> ways you know from yeah. from the sixties you have like track radio and now you can just you know you, ha- you have a device in in your pocket or some most of us do I don't think mm-hmm. you do Mm-mm. uh that you can just press play and up oh, you're recording now mm-hmm. and you can send that anywhere mm-hmm. w- without having a physical copy mm-hmm. what has that journey been like for you H- have you embraced it or have you kind of just let other people do that for you? That's wow. Um, well, in terms of recording, I mentioned my friend Doug Smith. So mm-hmm. absolutely, he does brilliant work, and anybody that's looking to record you should be calling this guy. Uh, and I, I am forever enormously grateful about that and around that because I know nothing, and I don't really want to. Mm. I don't want to have to. I would not want to have to buy all that technology and figure out how to use it. There's just no way. I just wouldn't bother. I would just go sing on street corners, um, which I've done and I've enjoyed. But, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, so on on an elemental level, on the most important level for me, nothing has changed Mm -hmm. in that. I just keep writing songs and looking for any way that I can to put them out there, whether it's through selling song, recorded songs in the form of um, CDs or um, you know online stuff that people can download. The first album I did was an album, 33 and a Third. Yeah. Uh, and I'm just going to do that as long as I'm walking around in this body. And to whatever extent it's successful, beautiful, and you know, to whatever extent it means something to somebody, I get the most wonderful letters from all kinds of people. And that's real wealth to me. That's mm-hmm. enormous. Um, in, terms of the, in terms of the music industry, and that's 
I, I kind of have to spit my words out when I say that because music never should have been turned into an industry. You know, as I said, the, the, the recording companies in the 60s and 70s, uh, those, they, were, they were much smaller and they were owned by people who really loved music and listened to what they were putting out. And, mm-hmm. and at some point after that, after some of the you know, really great stuff, Sgt. Pepper sold you know, so many copies. And after that started to happen, then all of a sudden these corporate guys who'd never listen to music, who don't care about music, Only all they saw profit. was, look at the money that's being made yeah. here. So some of these guys who own oil companies would buy record companies. Oh, really? And, yeah, and shut them. You know, they would just shut down the most important record companies and replace them with these totally meaningless, uh, you know, the— Plastic? Yeah, yeah, and the people that were, that, that were working for them, you know, they basically were, were told, you know, lowest common denominator, find out what sells and duplicate mm-hmm. that. Well, you do that, that's death. And it's not yes. art. It won't get, you know, I mean, these days they call everybody who's playing music an artist. Sorry, but that's a pile of bovine manure. There, there is no way, you know, an artist is a Picasso, is a Matisse, is a Bob Dylan, is a Joni Mitchell. That's an artist. Um, but you, you, don't, you don't become an artist suddenly because somebody signs some contract in some corporation somewhere. Um, or because you sing a song that someone else wrote to be sung and be popular. Exactly, and 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 I'm not, I'm not um, stepping on anyone who's just you know trying to make music and struggle, or who's who's doing a lot of copy tunes but doing it really well. Those people exist and they're beautiful, and mm-hmm. I I support that. What I don't support is uh, is an industry that. Um, only cares for the money aspect. Yeah, and yeah. literally, I mean, I remember one time I was watching a documentary where a, a group of uh, businessmen uh, from one of these corporations was sitting around a table talking about boy bands. And they literally were saying, uh, yeah, and I don't remember which boy band it was, but they literally were talking about this band by name, on camera, realizing that th- these kids could see them at some point, perhaps. Mm-hmm. And these guys were talking about this, and they were saying, yeah, well, this band, blah, 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 we'll just, we'll just squeeze all the lifeblood out of them. Maybe another six months or maybe a year we'll get out of them, and we just throw that away, and we, then we build another yep. boy band. Yep. Nothing organic about it. What they're going to do is put ads in the paper saying we need cute guys who can sing well and have some right. kind of harmonies. And this is like, you know, it's like you're hiring somebody to work at IBM. Yeah. It's not art. And it is it's factory. And it's, it, it, it's horrific. Yeah. So, um, you know, I have very strong feelings about that. So I'm not interested in, in being a part of any of that. Uh, the good news is that in the same way that um, Haight Ashbury, you know, this, this brilliant music arose out of there uh, organically or out of, um, you know, Mercy Beat or that sort of thing. Um, that will happen again organically when people are if 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 humanity lives long enough and people become wise enough again to realize that they don't that they shouldn't just buy everything that is sold to them or they market should, it to them right yeah. they should look more deeply and so uh, you know when that happens uh, great music will arise again I feel like it's happening now um, there's there's a ever growing popular anti-establishment movement happening now in, in regards to um like music or other cultural institutions yeah um that are really doing a lot of great work uh because right now you can you can really you can post your own music to soundcloud and it'll reach an entire market that would never have had happened if uh you know yeah. If it, or you Spotify, you can, it's so it's really relatively easy yeah. to get on the Spotify. So, okay, but that's part of what I'm what I'm looking at and struggling with. Mm. So each time I put out another album, what I've been doing for a good while is is putting out CDs. And even though we've been told that everybody just wants to download stuff off of the internet, I have found that my audience, for whatever that's worth, have been more interested in actually CDs. There are a certain number of people that will download stuff and that's fine. But the thing is that when you you know when you make a CD, 
then you've got this whole thing that yep. you can hold in your hand, and it's got paintings and photographs, and it's got all of the lyrics right there. Um, to me, this is extremely important, in part because, I mean, imagine, and maybe you're too young to get what I'm saying with this, I don't know, but if Sar- I'm pointing out there because I see Sergeant Pepper on the wall of the <laughs> studio here. Um, if Sgt. Pepper had been released just on Spotify with individual songs rather than as an album, what would have happened? I wonder. And the, 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 whole, the whole essential unity of that project, I think, would have been deeply lost. I, and I this is the more important part right. about that, which is the, the, there are very few people whose music is on Spotify who get any sort of revenue from it at right. all. Right, yeah. Meanwhile, right. you get yep. these jokers like Joe Rogan who are paid $100 million a year to be on there barking and shouting and, you know? It's like, yeah. it's like uh, I mean, Neil Young had a very good point. Aside from whatever that argument was about the COVID thing, you've got to get a lot of plays on there to get any money at all, That's and right. and that should not be happening. You people who are writing music, I'm, and listen, let me make this very clear: I am not interested in being a millionaire or a billionaire or any of that. I right. really don't want it. I don't want it. But what I want is enough visibility to people who care about what I'm doing. And I want to be able to make enough to live on, which is, again, in, in my life is not much. Yeah. Um, but when it's making so much money for people and they're not paying for those artists, mm-hmm. they're not supporting them, again, th- this is something very deeply we should be looking at around our culture. It, it is a trade-off because with Spotify, you get, you get you know Spotify and um all that access and i there, there's an interesting point to uh what you said about the cd because i i was thinking about it and i had cds back when i was a kid and that's <laughs> <laughs> the way it was and um i i would almost always have my favorite songs right and i would skip through whatever else i, I wasn't really paying attention to and it's kind of the same way on Spotify, but I, I, I guess your argument would be that you kind of didn't have a choice if you didn't want to listen to anything else because you would have to listen either to those favorite songs over and over again, which would get annoying, or you could just give a chance and listen to those other songs that you just really didn't get a, give a fair chance, to be say. Um, so there, there is, I guess there is a value. And also, yes, having it as something physical in your hands, I do, I do realize the immense power of that. I, uh, one of the... One of the only CD tracks that I've ever bought because I, I really desperately wanted it was uh, Aida, the soundtrack to Aida, mm-hmm. um, because I, I just love Elton John yeah. is one of my favorite composers yeah. ever. Um, so, but I it, there is a trade off to having to doing Spotify. You get the visibility, but don't, you don't get paid shrimp for it. Yeah. Um, SoundCloud, same kind of thing. Bandcamp is is a decent compromise between that. I'm learning. Um, but then again, when you have to find burning CDs is, is a lost tradition. Yeah. I, I've never, I've seen people do it. I've never had to do it myself. Yeah. Um, but I guess that is one way to, and that probably costs money. Yeah. I would assume so anyway. Uh, well, but it's not that expensive. I mean, when I, when I do a new album and I do a, a whole bunch of these at once, it's not, it works. It's very doable. And there's enough, um, support there that you know people who are really interested in it uh so i'm happy to do that and plus i you know i don't pay a lot of attention to this stuff but i see these little articles here and they're saying that cds are going are on the swing CDs upswing are on the rise, again yes and you know i've been hearing that's so just like okay that's good i think because it again it's it's this physical piece of art that you can hold in your hands that gives you the whole picture combined and all of those songs because for me as with sergeant pepper for me, those songs all belong together. You know, they mm. arose out of this being uh, at the same time in a certain order together, and that holds value for me. And I want to, I want to convey that to a group of people. And that's something that an artist can understand, and that the artist in any person can understand, but that the, you know, corporate the corporate classic, people don't yeah. even think about. 
Um, yeah. Yeah. So my question is, um, do you have to do for in regards to like burning CDs? Do you have do you have somebody do that for you? Like, how do you have to do that on your own? Yeah, there are comp- no, there are companies that do it. That, I would assume so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they'll they'll mass produce them and they'll they'll burn um, or they'll print the uh, artwork and so on. You What's know, the cost like. Um, I don't remember offhand, but it's reasonable. It's, it's, it's reasonable. It's reasonable. Okay, that's always good. Reason, um, reasonable is acceptable. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's um that's And some... you know again too the, you know with with when I do this um these albums always have a number of musicians on them in addition to the three of us right. other friends of ours who perform on it and you know and I'll do I'll do uh like kickstarter kinds of things um and people who who love us and have watched us for a long time have been incredibly supportive and help us um to get these things happening and and so in the end, I don't make much money, but I'm not worried about it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like I, um, and when I can make some money, I try to give it to, um, to the engineer, to Doug. Uh, I try to give it to the other musicians um, because, number one, it's a labor of love for me. Number two, it is a labor of love for them or they wouldn't mm-hmm. be doing it. They wouldn't be playing with me if it was just, you know. For business. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, that's, yeah. You know. So what is it like now that you're getting in your upper years of age? Mm-hmm. Has there <laughs> been any restrictions that you found? Any compromises that you had to do? Any, like, vocal stuff, vocal straining or anything like that? No. I, I don't feel like much of anything has changed. Um, Your back doesn't hurt? Oh, my <laughs> back my back might hurt occasionally, but, you know, I've got a good chiropractor. She oh, knows good. what she's doing. And um, uh, I, I eat really well. I eat uh, completely naturally. I don't eat refined sugar. I don't take drugs or alcohol or smoke or any of that stuff. Um, so I don't feel like I don't feel like my abilities to witness consciousness have been affected mm. by the fact that this body's older than it was ten years ago. Um, I don't I don't feel old, which is uh, a, a wonderfully surprising joy that I have. Um, so you, you uh, last time I saw you at the concert, you you seemed very spry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean I again I'm I'm really grateful and I think, you know, and that's probably related to I do meditation every morning uh and I have been for 48 years. Uh I do yoga usually every day for a while, about an hour, sometimes longer, sometimes less. Um so all of those things really help to uh keep one attuned to, you know, this body is just an instrument, uh, mm-hmm. and it's not me. I am not this body. And, uh, you know, I, I think of it as if you wore the same overcoat every day for, you know, six, seven decades, and it started to fall apart and become, you know, torn and, uh, you know, filthy and whatever, uh, and it finally kind of turns to dust, mm-hmm. would you say, I am that overcoat? No. You would say, I don't need that overcoat anymore. Right. And it's the same thing with these bodies that we walk around in. I don't, so I don't, I don't, anytime I hear somebody say, oh, I feel old, I, I, I like to point out to them, you know, look in the sky at night and there's millions of stars there and I'd like you to consider that probably two thirds of those stars have not been there for eons. Right. So, and there's so many more stars that have yet to be seen. Right. So I wouldn't get too uptight about worrying about a body that goes for a hundred years or something. It's mm-hmm. like, and again, it's not you. So. <laughs> 
Well, I think we're ending out uh, a little bit of our time here. Do you want to uh, present more of your songs? I'd love to do. Actually, uh, that's what I want to do. Sure. Uh, which one would you like to pull up next? Well, uh, I'm I'm uh, I'm wondering. What, well, let's do. We'll be able to get to all of them, I think. Okay. Then in that case, um. Since we had a very quiet one, why don't you do Neil Conquistador? Neil Conquistador. Do you want to talk about uh, that at all? Sure. Um, I, um, my entire life have been a pacifist, mm. and um, I don't intend for that to change in any way. I, when I was. Uh, 18 and I had to register they made me register for the draft it was right at the time that the draft had just ended and I the Vietnam War yeah it was during the Vietnam War and I I said to them um it was right at the tail end and I said to them uh right away look I want a meeting because I want it very clear to you that if I register you're going to register me as a conscientious objector because I'm not Mm -hmm. killing anybody and um, so we had we had a meeting uh, with the draft board, and I had several people to you know vouch for my sincerity. Um, and I really made my point, and I I wrote an essay about it, which I gave to them, and uh, be, and I I did that because I I didn't know if they were you know who knows with the government they could start the draft again three months later, and. I wanted it clear right from the start. If you're talking to me, I'm a conscientious, conscientious objector, and I am not going to pick up a gun against anybody. I'm not going to do paperwork that sends other people out to pick up guns against anybody. I'm not killing anybody. And you want to put me in prison? You go ahead. You want to uh, put me up in front of the firing squad? You go ahead. But I'm not killing anybody. And um, so this song addresses that. Yeah. So this is clearly an anti war song. Yeah, it sounded like it when I was playing the first thing. I was like, this is definitely an anti war, anti like imperialistic <laughs> kind of song. It's, so this is Neo Conquistador by John Tolazzo. Neo Conquistador, let the flames rise up from your heart. There is nothing to conquer here on this charnel ground floor. Neil Conquistador, let the flames rise up from your heart. That sword cannot serve you anymore. They bound you in irons, fed you on glory. You were just a boy, where have we heard this story? Shame, mortal chain. They conscripted the poor, smeared blood on your door, promised you golden slaves and more. Shame, mortal chain. They sent you away from Valencia's shores, said kill everything that we deplore. Shame, mortal chain. So you followed the rules, you obeyed their orders, and the innocents were drawn and quartered. Shame, Shame, mortal chain. Neil Conquistador, let the flames rise up from your heart. There is nothing to conquer here on this charnel ground floor. the door, let the flames rise up from your heart, that sword cannot serve you anymore. Why are you killing? For what do you die? Merchants and brokers pile skulls on high shame, mortal chain. While back at the palace, the prophets rise They don't care about the ghosts in your eyes Shame, mortal chain Where are the elders? Where are 
the kings Where are the ones who's supposed to teach you about these things? Shame, mortal chains They're kissing the ring on some inquisitor's hand They don't give a damn whether you fall or stand Shame, mortal chains Neil Conquistador, let the flame rise up from your heart There is nothing to conquer here on this charnel ground floor Neil Conquistador, let the flames rise up from your heart That sword cannot serve you your face, there's blood on your hands, there's blood all over that ancient land. Shame, mortal chains. Throw down your sword and lift up your soul. It's not too late to rise up and say no. Neil Conquistador, let the flames rise up from your heart. It is only yourself you must conquer here at last. Neil Conquistador, let the flames rise up from your heart. This sword cannot serve you. It never has. Hmm. So a very anti-war, very very much peaceful telling or is it forcing or telling them to stop more do you think well i i hope it's forcing i hope that it has its uh has its effect i i don't mean just this song but the whole mm. the whole movement you know it um i don't know if 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 there's anybody that doesn't realize this yet but wars at this point are fought for one reason and one reason only which profit. is profit it uh, and and a big part of that is fueled by the system itself. Um, you know, if you go to Capitol Hill, there's there's uh, seven or eight uh, lobbyists from uh, uh, arms manufacturers mm -hmm. for every uh, congressperson, and so as soon as there's any disagreement anywhere in the world about anything. Those guys immediately want to turn it into another war and are encouraging them to do that. And they, they go overboard to try to make that happen because they will often, in fact, sell guns to both sides in yes. many conflicts. We were doing that in World War II, and it still happens today. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's unbelievably immoral. And, um, you know, people, people have this... Uh, cliche you know that they say that it that it, during the vietnam war that when the soldiers came back that those of us who were anti-war were spitting on the soldiers that may have happened a few times but i mean literally a few because mm -hmm. the vast majority of us who were marching against that war absolutely supported the soldiers because those soldiers were victims of yes. the system and they should never have been sent there and if you look at the situation now, you know, at that time they were saying to us, um, you know, we have to fight in Vietnam to keep the world safe for democracy. Mm -hmm. Well, there's no democracy still in Vietnam. Right. The only thing that's different is that now there is capitalism in Vietnam, and those companies are doing business in Vietnam. I thought they were communists. Th they are, but nonetheless, there's, su there's uh, uh, s supply and, and demand. And right. so the, the American companies are now doing business with them, whereas oh, okay. they didn't use, you know, it, uh, Ho Chi Minh and those guys would not have done that. I'm not, um, you know, I'm just saying. Right, yes. At that time, it was cut and dry. 
But, but what's changed, it's not that people have gotten all these freedoms in Vietnam. No, what they've gotten is a more capitalistic, communist-run system mm -hmm. that does business with the United States corporations. Suddenly, they're not anybody's enemy anymore. Um, that's, that's horrible. And so, the, 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 you know, when people say support the troops, I say, you want to support the troops? Don't send them Don't to send any them more wars. Stop the wars. So is there ever a time where you think it's necessary for war, uh, like World War II? Do you think that's a necessary evil? Do you think Putin with the war in Ukraine is a necess 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 necessary uh, problem where we have, to, okay, we have to put our foot down and then send our troops there to stop that? Uh, I don't think we should send troops to Ukraine. Mm. Um, I don't. I do think that there's a great deal more that we can do, and a lot of it is happening already in terms of getting uh, all the various countries around the world to cooperate in making things very difficult for Russia economically. And it's having its effect. They're really feeling it. It is having it, its effect, but also at the same time, uh, Russia is. Um, I don't know if you've seen this, but they're they're now backing their their money back up with co with uh, gold. Yeah, and it's boosting their economy, and they're separating themselves from the global yeah, structure, which is working I for know. them. Uh, with with we'll, China, we'll as see well. how it goes. We'll see. But I I I I never think that sending uh, people to kill more people, where people are being killed already, I never think that's a good idea. There there are other ways to do it. One of the things that um, deeply impressed me from the beginning of this scenario is that... Of oh, the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Yeah, okay. is that um, many of the Russian soldiers, unfortunately, and this is no surprise to me, and I think it happens a lot to American soldiers too, they were just sent there and they weren't told anything until they were on the ground. Mm -hmm. Now you're going to go kill these people here. And a lot of those guys put down their guns and surrendered to the Ukrainians. And the Ukrainians took them in and gave them food and gave them places to live and gave them their cell phones to call their mothers to let them know they were okay. Mm. That's real humanity. That's forgetting about borders, mm -hmm. uh, especially in a scenario like that because this guy has no interest whatsoever except his ego, this guy Putin. Right. Um, and the whole reason for the war is to... Uh, if if you don't know, he he wants to rebuild the Russian or the Soviet Union, and right. b Ukraine being the breadbasket of Europe right. is very valuable, and that's it, it's been it's been a fight between the West getting Ukraine versus Russia getting Ukraine for a while. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So. Yeah, and there was all of that mess with, with Putin and Trump around all of that when you know refusing. Uh, it it was horrible. It's. These guys are acting like um, mafia mob bosses that are, you know, divvying up neighborhoods and cooperating when they need to. And then at some point, if we let them get what they want, which is total control, then they'll be at each other's throats when that time comes. We can't let that happen. Um, uh, you know, and the people, the people of Russia, they don't want this thing to be happening. Mm -hmm. There's been massive protests yeah. across Russia. Yeah, and uh, um, and, it, and that's a huge risk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, that you know, we need to look at that very clearly in this culture. Um, there are people in this culture that are. There is no question that they are trying to uh, completely destroy this democracy and put an oligarchy in its place, and. Uh, they're, one of the ways they're doing that is uh, the Republican Party is trying really hard to stop the rest of us from voting. So we've got to vote. That's the first step, and there's much more that needs to be said. Um, but uh, So the next song you would... Yes. Oh, you yeah, would, yeah, the last illumination. The last illumination... Um, has influences from a couple of different places. One is, uh, The Last Illumination is, the subtitle is uh, The Ghost of Arthur Rambeau. And uh, 
Rimbaud was a great um, French surrealist poet. Um, amazing work that he did. All when he was very, very young. I mean, a lot of his greatest poems were written by the time he was 17. And I don't remember, maybe for a few years after that. Um, but then, you know, he, he didn't have... An, he, this, here's a scenario where he didn't have any elders to sort of lead him into sanity mm. uh, or to in, you know, support and encourage his work while also giving him healthy alternatives. Again, when I, met, when I was a kid and I was writing poems and I met Gary Moore, one of the things that Gary Moore showed me was how to not be destroyed by a system that, that doesn't care for art, that has no interest in art. Um, but Rambeau didn't have that. And so he went deeper and deeper into deeper spirals of pain and suffering and uh, misery. And he, went, he wound up dying very young, a drunken, syphilitic, syphilitic gunrunner, um, which is a horrible shame, but it's very indicative of what happens when the elders refuse to take responsibility for bringing the young across that line into adulthood. And <clears throat> so that's Rambeau. So I was thinking about that a good bit, and I was thinking about, right, you know, I was working in my mind uh, this, some ideas and some lines around the ghost of Arthur Rambeau when... Uh, there was uh, suddenly another um, horrible uh, gunning down of children in the school. Um, Columbine? No, the, the, the small school. Sandy Hook? Sandy Hook. Happened at that point when I was starting to work on this. And, I mean, uh, such horrific thoughts that, that this could even happen. And, again, it's because we're so materialistic and we're so removed from the heart and the soul and um, you know I was feeling that really deeply and then this thing happened at Sandy Hook and um, and then this song arose in part because it's not that I was feeling sorry for the killer I wasn't but on a certain level I was because here was this kid who was raised in this um, broken broken system that that you know is is morally bankrupt on every level, and there was no guidance there as to how to become a functioning and compassionate and beautiful adult, and uh, so yeah, you know we failed that kid, and what he did was absolutely horrific, and that's I'm not excusing it. But it's doubly horrific that we keep letting it happen, and then it yeah. just happened again the other day, in Buffalo. In Buffalo, New yeah. York. Um, uh, there's there's something to be said that, yeah, we can't excuse this behavior, but we also can't unexcuse the the events that led to this to this happening. If if you love your kids, and uh, deeply care about your kids these events will not be happening anymore because it won't come to their mind that it won't, they won't be at that point of desperation to have right. to do this. Right. If you take care of your children and hold them close to you and don't let them go and don't let anyone take them either because that happens all of the cults and, and all sorts of ideologies and everything. You have to keep your children close because you, and there's a, there's a big conversation about that happening in America right now. Uh, who's responsible for the kids? Yeah. Are they your kids as as parents, or are they the teachers' kids, or are they yeah. the society's kids? Yeah. In in my opinion, it, as the parent, you are the molder of your child, and yeah. you have to take that with such a serious, serious um demeanor. Because there are there's so many little things we, we talk about this a little bit uh, a lot, a little bit a lot in uh, previous podcasts where just a simple act of not hugging your child when you leave for work, yeah. that's going to affect them for so long yeah. and they won't even realize it. Right. Just, just, and when they, when they come up to you and ask you a question and you passively say, not right now, 
And then they're going to get that in my mind. Oh, well, he doesn't want to, she, she or she doesn't want to hear me. They don't want to hear, they, they, wanna, they don't want to, they don't want to spend time and answer my questions. So I'm not going to ask yeah. them any more questions. Yeah. And then you realize what happened to my child. Yeah. And, and you slowly realize that they're not acting the same way that they did. Yeah. And, and it's so easy to just ignore your child yeah. and yeah. do your own life. Yeah. Because you already have so many things, you know, right. but you have to you have to be with your child, and you have to embrace your child, and you have to love your child, or else these things are still are going to keep happening yeah. again and again. And these things are going to, and you have to realize that these things are going to happen again and again yeah. and again yeah. because it's it's nobody is perfect. Yeah, but you can try the best you can to take hold of your children. And to protect your children, and to make sure that they are in a healthy spot, because that is healthy parenting, healthy yeah. children, yeah. healthy society. Yeah, and uh, you're absolutely right about that. And karmically, we've got um, a system that teaches from the top down that if you want something, you take it, and if you have to be violent and kill people to do it, you do it. Mm -hmm. Um. All of us are against slavery. Well, all of us that are have that wisdom. Right. <laughs> um, and yet, you know, so many of the things that we buy all the time. We become slaves to. Uh, well, we become slaves to those things, but also they're manufactured by slaves. Oh, yeah, yeah. The, the... And, you know, that's <laughs> happening. Oh, yes. Tremendously. And people... Uh, you know, we we have to ask ourselves, how many more things do we need? Maybe we should buy less. Maybe we should make those companies think that it's not a good idea to enslave people. Um, you know, because there are places where people are being paid very little. Uh, for instance, um, um, China is a really good example of that, where yeah. where they get cents cents uh, to live, and they make our iPhones, they make our shoes, they make everything, right. and and that's. That, that's part of like the whole – that happened a lot in the 60s, 70s, 80s where a lot of American companies outsourced their uh, right. factories right. to right. to dif these different areas. And it should be made illegal. It should. For, for any United States company to do that. And I've, I know people who have been there who have seen it firsthand. One scenario where uh, people were making some of these cell phones and things and they were living in a high-rise building – and they were not allowed to leave the building. They worked seven days a week, all day. They got a few hours of sleep at night. And what happened was um, some of those people started to go to the top floor of the building and leap off. Mm. And do you know what the, what the solution to that problem was? Building a net? The corporations built nets around wow. the thing on lower ground so that if, they, if somebody did leap from above, They'd get ca caught in the net, and they'd be brought back in and forced back to work. And this is, you know, these are the cell phones that everybody's buying and just saying, oh, yeah, beautiful, cool. Let's take a picture. Let's do a selfie. Let's, you know, it's like we need to think about what we do. And Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I don't, I don't mean that judgmentally. I'm, I'm saying we need to look at ourselves mm -hmm. and um, – and and make some very clear changes and uh, and and a large part of that is the profit. It's much cheaper to do it that way. But if we br brought our factories back to like America or into a, a Western nation that has these proper laws in place, yeah. it yeah, it's going to be a little bit more expensive, sure. But at least we're not we're not contributing to slavery. Right. And we need right. And we need leadership that will say you don't have a choice. American corporations, mm -hmm. you do it, and you pay people what they're worth instead of, you know, instead of trying to force people into these. Um, I'm kind of impressed by how many people are refusing to go to work right now because um, they're doing everything they can to figure out how to live more simply because they don't want to have to work for nothing, and and I don't, I don't blame them for that. I, um, but again, mm -hmm. um, so. So that's leading us to this song, which I, for <laughs> we, I forgot we were talking about that. That's right. Um, so this is the ghost of Arthur Rambeau, and, and it doesn't, you know, even though it, it was influenced by those things, when you listen to the song, if you didn't hear of any of what I just said, you wouldn't necessarily pick that up. Mm. But um, nonetheless, there's a, uh, there's a movement of consciousness that happens 
through a song like this. And again, I'm not bragging when I say that. It, it, on a certain level, it has nothing to do with me. It's just I'm, I'm learning to just keep my eyes open, and when a song comes, put it down the way it wants to show itself. And with that said, this is the last illumination, the ghost of... Arthur Rambo. Arthur Rambo. <laughs> Echo on the Pantheon walls The strange world is praised In the clarion call The queen ascends her throne As you reach for the unknown And all the stars dissolve on your tongue Who stole this heart? Dancers astound us, blossoms in their hair, delirium surrounds us, the Abyssinian air. The broken are endowed with will, the vile are made fair, the empty of heart are filled, and the thieves offer their share. Oh, who stole this heart?
one thing I wish that we could have gone more into talking about is definitely the composition of, of the pieces because it's very interesting to me. Um, is just to get uh, a sampling. Is it more of uh, do you know any theory or is it just what sounds good to you? Uh, it's completely just what sounds good to me. I don't I don't read notes on a pap on a page. Mm. I never learned. I actually. A couple times I learned, you know, like I took flute lessons for a while when I was a kid, and I learned a little bit for a little while, or I'd learn enough to pass a test in school, but then it just would not stick in my head. Mm. There's something, you know, I, I, I guess I just tend to be more uh, intuitive or something. I don't know what the word is. And um, so I just always do it by ear, and, um, and, and, you know, as I'm writing a song, it'll become clear to me like oh harmonies would be really wonderful here or a solo would be great here or or then when i when i perform it or or sit down and re and work with it with Christina and Paul and or some other musicians who join us occasionally um you know they'll throw some ideas in and then all these wonderful things just start happening and that's a real joy that's like you know like you're kind of working on a big painting together, mm -hmm. you know. That's awesome. Uh, so it's more definitely more improvisational. Yeah, there's a lot of that energy there. Cool. Well, this next song, the last song, is going to be Plague in the City. And Thank we were you. talking about it a little bit uh, during the song, and you had said that this had come before the pandemic. Yeah. And uh, is there any, <coughs> any, any main <coughs> message in this song? Well, uh, uh, yeah, I think the main message in this song is look out. <laughs> and that's <laughs> it. Know? Well, yeah, I mean, I actually, this song I wrote probably 30 years ago. Mm. Uh, unlike most of the other songs in the album, they're all brand new. But um, I've got hundreds of songs that have not been recorded yet and that... Uh, you know, I just have to do one album at a time based on what I can afford to do. And so there are songs sometimes that come from the, the past that I really love and, you know, I want that one to be recorded. So when we did this last album, Plague in the City, was one of those. I just thought, you know, I've always enjoyed performing it live. And um, so I wanted, to get, I wanted to get it done on an album. And... Uh, so we put that together, we recorded it, um, and the pandemic didn't happen for, I don't know, six months after the album was put out. Mm -hmm. So it's it's just maybe coincidental, but nonetheless, in the bigger picture, uh, it's certainly, if you listen to the images in it, uh, it's, it's, it's a very crowded, complicated world full of images, and... Um, A lot of those things speak of the grief and sort of alienation that I feel about much of, of the what has happened to the world. And uh, I have great hope about it, though, and I always will. Um, so when this song came out, it was just kind of interesting that, that it was followed up by the pandemic. Um, there's a plague in the city. Uh, you know, it's um, um, with what's happening in the world. I mean, one of the things that rarely gets talked about, and I'm not a scientist, but we know that COVID was a big deal, is a big deal, and we're paying attention. And fortunately, we've done a good bit of improvement over the initial complete ignoring of the thing that the government was doing here. Um, but it's the point is that you've got all these people barking at one another about, you know, masks or no masks, vaccinations or no vaccinations, you know conspiracy this conspiracy that you know and just it's like the real important issue around this is covid 
is arising from nature, and it's telling us something, and it's not done speaking. And there will, if we don't step up and do what needs to be done about ending the pollution of this earth, we're going to be in deep trouble, and this COVID thing will be a faint little blip in the radar of what's to come. Um, so do you think the virus maybe was course-correcting humanity almost? I think so, very much so. I think nature is doing that all the time, trying to. Mm. And it's a question of whether we pay attention or not. Um, well, with all that said, yeah, it's, this is Plague in the City. He was a thief, they punished him for stealing In the tower's shadow they cut off his hand In a street of red-haired actresses acting And a vendor with black eyes so blood oranges The daughters of voodoo in their brass bandanas Were cast in lots in the dirt And Mad Louisa at the gates of the market Was pretending not to hear the soldiers' dirty word circled the village led by the bishop of Antioch the cup looked ill but nobody noticed as he took a sip from the golden cup pop it on go shouted the orphan girl she spotted a man on a great chapel mare but he didn't hear her he had his mind on the world he was going to buy some honey dog down the bay. There's a plague in the city I hear the sound of bells in the street This is no place for gypsies Make haste, my love, let us flee There was a young minstrel with a voice like honey on the cathedral stairs he was eating some fruit when a japanese woman came by in a buggy she said oh momo may i play your ivory flute the spaniard left the tent gave toast to the squire he took off his armor and threw it to the street he was still laughing when he put his sword to the blacksmith's fire and he pointed to the punctured holes in his hands and feet Dancers at the blue flute altar Were feasting on squash and sweet melon One of them claimed the earth for the creator Who gave his fixed on the flight of the snowy heron Papa don't go, shouted the orphan girl To a nervous man standing in front of the jail He grasped the pentangle round his neck most desperately As he was tempted with still another mug of there's a plague in the city I hear the sound of bells in the street This is no place for gypsies Make haste, my love, let us flee Three mystical sisters were bathing at the well while white-haired monkeys ran circles in the dust Valiant women, all their eyes burned of wisdom As they watched a monkey spin like chariots Night fell like a mantle on the tower of the city Rumors of cannibalism spread through the dark Slaves with burning torches set fire to the prison For inside the plague had left its merciless mark There's a plague in the city I hear the sound of bells in the street This is no place for gypsies Make haste, my love, let us flee An angel 
with a twisted wing shouted a warning His words like a trumpet blast loud and true They took him alive and showed him no mercy They live in the dark and know not what they do The mystical sisters are ashamed and naked Drew magical pictures in the air While the orphan girl went in search of the minstrel She saw no one at the cathedral stairs There's a plague in the city I hear the sound of bells in the street This is no place for gypsy Barred with a ring in his ear That's a woman in terror dove from a balcony She couldn't bear her reflection in the empty mirror Stampeding horses ran through the temple A phoenix flew over the dome And a thief with no hands turned away in his agony It's an Egyptian slave sent the torch to his home An Egyptian slave sent the torch to his home An Egyptian slave set the torch to his home An Egyptian slave set the torch to his home An Egyptian slave set the torch to his home An Egyptian slave set the torch to his home An Egyptian slave set the torch to his home An Egyptian slave set the torch to his home An Egyptian slave set the torch to his home That was uh, almost sort of speaking when that was on. <laughs> um, and that was Plague in the City by John Tolazo. If you want to see more of his work, you can visit his website, johntolazo.com, or you can. Uh, you, are you open to people coming to your Facebook page at all? Yeah, sure. Yeah, you can. Uh, so, John Tolazo on Facebook um, is super awesome, dude. Definitely check out his, his work. And. You can go to his event happening at the Universalist Church in York, uh, coming up on June tenth. Is there a time for that? Seven p.m. Seven p.m. Friday night. Yeah, Unitarian Universalist Church of York. In the it'll be an outdoors thing in their gardens. Beautiful place. Cool. Well, there's one last question I want to ask you before we end off, and that is, what do you know now that you would wish you had known back when you first started? And this can be related to music, to being spiritual wise or poetry wise, what do you think that would be? Mm. <laughs> That's putting me on the spot. Um, I can't come up with an answer right at this moment. I'd have to think about that. Mm. Well, if that's the case, well, you can think about that. I'll have you on again because there is so much more we, we did not get to talk about today. All right. And with Sounds that good. said, I this has been Corey Rosen with the Story Podcast with Mr. John Tolazzo. Everybody, I hope you have a good rest of your day, and we'll see you guys next time. Bye.